Hello, welcome to another episode of the Charity Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Blake, and my role is to help charities to increase their income and impact. On the podcast, I speak to people who can share insights from their experience on a range of topics relating to social impact. You can find out more about my work in the podcast, including all episodes with notes and resources at kedaconsulting.co.uk. Please do let me know what you think of the episode. I'd love to know what you take away from it, what you find interesting, what I could be doing better. You can leave a review on your podcast player or just send me a message by email, LinkedIn or Twitter. All the details are at kedaconsulting.co.uk. So I'm joined today by Rodri Davies, a widely respected expert and commentator on philanthropy and civil society issues. Roger has got a new book coming out soon um, titled What is Philanthropy For? which is available for pre-order now. I'll put the link and everything on the website. The book asks, does charitable giving still matter but need to change? Philanthropy, the use of private assets for public good, has been much criticised in recent years. Do elite philanthropists wield too much power? Is big money philanthropy unaccountable and therefore anti-democratic? And what about so-called tainted donations and dark money funding pseudo philanthropic political projects? The COVID-19 pandemic amplified many of these criticisms, leading some to conclude that philanthropy needs to be fundamentally reshaped if it's to play a positive role in our future. Um, so it sounds like there's lots of interesting stuff to dig into there. Roger is the founder and director of Why Philanthropy Matters a space for exploring philanthropy, what it is, how it works, why it affects all of our lives. Uh, Rodri draws on his deep knowledge and passion for the history of philanthropy, as well as current issues and trends, put it in context and help us understand where it's come from, what it looks like today and where it might be going in the future. He is also Pears Research Fellow in the Centre for Philanthropy at the University of Kent and also philanthropy expert in residence at Pears Foundation. He hosts Philanthropisms, the podcast that puts philanthropy in context, and he was formerly head of policy at Charities Aid Foundation, where he created and led the in-house think tank Giving Thought. This is a fairly lengthy introduction, but I think it's useful just to um, let you know all of the things that Rodri is involved in. Uh, he wrote another book back in 2016 about how philanthropy shapes Britain, looking at the history of philanthropy, something that he is maybe obsessed by, might be fair to say. <laughs> um, has a separate Twitter account tweeting about that specifically, at for literacy. And then he's involved in some really interesting external projects and steering groups as well, including the World Economic Forum, Technology and Social Justice Initiative, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Better Giving Studio, and the Wellcome Trust funded Border Crossings Project, which is exploring the relationship between voluntary action and the NHS since 1948, which I'd be interested in. I don't think we had it on the agenda, but actually it's, it's really relevant to one of the clients I work with, helpful, so involved in supporting volunteering in the NHS. So welcome to the podcast, Rodri, after that lengthy introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think that I do too many things these days. I should probably <laughs> rationalise it a bit. But... There's a lot of interesting stuff there. So, what was the what was the motivation to really focus on philanthropy in the way that you have done? Perhaps you can kind of talk through where where that started and what your sort of career trajectories looks like about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'd love to pretend it was all part of a sort of carefully thought through strategic plan that I had mapped out from, mm -hmm. from the time I left university, but it, it wasn't. It's more a sort of series of happy accidents and then latterly a bit more kind of concerted thought. So I, I launched out on the path of wanting to become an academic. So I did maths and philosophy at university, and then I wanted to go on and do philosophy postgraduate and basically spend the rest of my life doing that. I just had a moment where I realized that the bit of philosophy that I was interested in was a niche within a niche within a niche. And it was so limited in that I was going to spend the rest of my life talking to a very, very small mm -hmm. number of people about something very, very abstract and technical. And I just sort of thought, actually, is is that what I want to be doing? I like the the skills that are involved in academia the research the writing the analysis but I, I want to do something that feels like it has a bit more real world um connection I managed through a kind of having an interim job that I needed to take just to get a bit of money to then get a foot in the door working for a think tank as a researcher and it so happened the project that they were doing at the time was about philanthropy it was all about how to get more philanthropy out of wealthy people in the city of London 
Um, and I'd been doing a load of work that involved me kind of interviewing kind of wealthy CEOs and top people in, in FTSE 100 companies. So I had some kind of background that they thought was interesting. And so I, I went off as a relatively junior employee and got to do all of these research interviews with loads and loads of kind of senior investment bankers and hedge fund managers and all this sort of stuff, mm. which was an absolutely fascinating crash course in what philanthropy is and, you know, how it works and what role it plays in society. And it wasn't something I'd ever really thought about to that point, but I was fascinated by it and, and hooked. And I basically kind of stayed in it for, you know, 15 years since then, gone ever further down the rabbit hole. Um, and as I've added new elements to that, so the history element, which again, wasn't something I knew a lot about. And then I ended up starting off writing a report that ballooned and turned into a book that was all about the history of philanthropy. And that's become a really sort of big part of the, the work I do these days. I've just found that there are endless new perspectives you can take on on philanthropy because there's so many ways that you can look at it. And so on any given day, it keeps me interested and in wanting to find out more. Mm. And out of interest, so the philosophy stuff that you were looking to go into, that was a niche within a niche within a niche. What what was the sort of particular area you're interested in? So uh, I'm particularly interested in the, the philosophy of maths, so the overlap between the two, and particularly around the sort of philosophical underpinnings of set theory and mathematical logic. So it, even people who are, who are kind of into <laughs> academic philosophy would sort of look at you slightly weirdly and go, really, is that, uh -huh. is that what you want to be doing? Um, but I, I maintain it's fascinating, but it is very technical and very niche. Yeah, yeah I think follow, following on from that, that useful sort of introduction, looking at, at that current portfolio of work that you've got, how's that come about maybe, I suppose, in the last sort of couple of years now since you left CAF and you've you've now got, I suppose you're doing what you'd love to be doing and and, and being paid to do that. So how how did that all come about? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I feel, you know, amazingly fortunate. And and one of the things that sort of happened over my time at CAF and and part of the reason I was there for probably a lot longer than I would have thought when I when I joined so I was there for 11 years in the end is I was able to evolve the role that I was doing a number of times and so it started out as a fairly kind of straightforward charity public policy role but we were then kind of able to add more elements to it as a few of us internally sort of said you know should we as well as doing that stuff that we need to keep doing you know the kind of let's engage with the government on what's going on around charity tax and, and all that kind of stuff should we try and take a bit more of a think tank approach and kind of use the fact that CAF has the the resources and you know enough people working there and research capacity to kind of step back a bit and say let's look at some of these issues around philanthropy from a slightly bigger picture perspective and so we we set up giving thought as a kind of in-house think tank where we could take a slightly different approach and have a slightly sort of different tone of voice and started doing discussion papers and blogs and we launched a, a podcast there and and he looked at all sorts of things from again you know kind of what history tells you about philanthropy what's going on globally in philanthropy now and also kind of what might be coming in the future and so I ended up doing a load of work about emerging technology and philanthropy and some quite sort of interesting speculative stuff um, and that's really where my heart lay and, and the stuff that really kind of excited me and, and kept me interested and through doing that obviously made lots of contacts with other sort of academics and people working in philanthropy all around the world so I've got developed a really sort of strong network and then like a lot of people during the pandemic started thinking about what I wanted to do next and I'd been at CAF for over a decade at that point anyway and just so happened the timing is really good and I had a few conversations with Pears Foundation about work they wanted to fund on philanthropy and also with Beth Breeze at the Centre for Philanthropy at the University of Kent who I've known for years and years and a few things sort of fell into place and allowed me to put together this nice little portfolio of, of roles, all of which overlap in, in quite a useful way. So the core work is mm. all quite similar, but then you're sort of taking slightly different approaches or putting it to different use. So, yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, it keeps me very busy <laughs> and sort of remembering which hat you're wearing at any one time can be a challenge. But, um, mm. but no, it's really good. I'd be interested to hear if you had a large fortune yourself what your approach would be to philanthropy. I don't know if this is something you daydream about at all or if it's something that you've done as a thought exercise. I've, yeah, I've done it as a thought exercise and I do quite regular. I've actually, I, I wrote up a version of this at the end of last year to ex precisely to make the point, I think, that people like me who spend their time 
offering their opinion about philanthropy or people who kind of work in in the philanthropy sector but aren't the ones who have the wealth so you know what they call the sort of the philanthropoids rather than the, the philanthropists I think it's a good question to ask yourself what would I do if if that was my money somehow I, I came into it or it just magically appeared because it's often easy to assume there's really straightforward answers to some of these questions about what you should focus on, how you should do philanthropy, you know, what sort of issues you need to take into account. Uh, and then it's easy sometimes to do that when you don't actually have to make those decisions yourselves. But if you if you think, hang on a minute, if I did actually have to make that decision, what would I do? I think that's a good challenge to yourself. So for instance, you know, if I had a load of money, I magically came into it, I don't know how. My first question to myself would be, how have I made that money? Is that kind of an ethically acceptable way of making money? Because that's quite a big factor. If you assume it is, then you've got a question of, well, is the best thing to do to find an existing organisation or range of organisations doing the work that you think is good and just give them the money and that that's it? Or do you go and set up your own thing, a foundation or a charity? Immediately, there's a question there about, is that an ego-driven thing? You know, why do you feel the need to kind of create something new when there's already lots of organizations out there doing good work? And do you risk duplicating that work? If there's a kind of clear idea that, you know, there is a, a good argument for setting something up, which I think I would personally, because... I've spent so much time thinking about philanthropy. I've got a lot of kind of ideas I'd want to test out. So I'd probably need a vehicle of some sort. But even then it's kind of, you know, what do you do? Do you set that up as an old fashioned charitable trust or a foundation, you know, that's kind of set up to exist in perpetuity? Or do you say, I'm going to have a time limit on this. Let's do this for 20 years and then spend all the money out and, and be done with it. What do you do with your investments? Do you go down the route of kind of traditional investment management and all the sort of potential challenges that brings in terms of where the money's invested coming into conflict with your with your mission or do you set out to kind of invest uh, in line with your mission from the outset I would definitely do that even if it's harder um, because I'd want to prove that you you can do that and then you know deciding mm. on what you focus do you kind of take the arguments of the effect of altruists and others that actually you shouldn't think about what you care about as a donor in your own personal experience. You should just think about what's the most effective thing I could do with my money. Or do you accept that actually philanthropy is inherently to do with the individual and their choices and, and sort of make your peace with that? I think I would. And I'd be honest with myself that the things I care about are things like uh, the environment, biodiversity, climate. So I would largely focus on that and also probably focus on some local giving because again in the work I've done I've sort of seen how powerful philanthropy can be when it focuses at a local level as well as a national one so I would want to kind of use that to try and do more work in and around the the area where where I live but yeah it's, it's a great mm -hmm. game to play with yourself and a yeah. short experiment to do I think assuming that you don't have a large fortune <laughs> Sadly not. No, it is. It is. It is all a thought experiment at the moment. Yeah. I don't know what your personal circumstances are. <laughs> yeah. So assuming that when you currently give to charities and and whatever causes you support, if it's a sort of five pounds a month, twenty pounds, hundred pounds, how much do you think about all of that? knowledge of philanthropy and strategic giving that you have in your head do you think about it in those terms and kind of take it really seriously where you're going to make that 20 pound donation or do you kind of see that as being something that you know it's it's not really worth the amount of time for the uh, sum of money that you're giving and you're kind of like oh I'm fairly relaxed about yeah I think I think it's not so much that I dismiss it as not being worth the time but i'm kind of aware there's a there is a danger of overthinking things when and and in a way it's quite it become the danger is if you start thinking about yourself as a philanthropist rather than you know a charitable giver when you only have very modest amounts to give i think that's that's fine if it's in a positive way and sort of seeing it as making a statement about doing things in a kind of considered fashion and having a clear idea in mind and not just kind of responding to things and being scattergun the only the danger comes if it if you veer into sort of centering yourself and being like, well, you know, philanthropy, so it's about me and what I can achieve. Whereas actually, if you've only got relatively modest amounts to give, you've got to be realistic that 
that actually you probably just need to give to organizations that are already out there doing the work, not make any particularly unreasonable demands. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't yeah. walk, I wouldn't give a, a donation to a charity and say, well, I want full impact reports on my 20 pounds a month, please. And, <laughs> and that kind of thing would be ridiculous. Um, and I, you know, I would be, I, I've spent so much time thinking about why criticisms of bigger donors who, who make unreasonable demands like that are kind of justifiable that I'd, as far as possible, want to have quite a lot of humility and just be realistic about what I could achieve. That being said, it, it is a challenge in that, like when my kids ask me, you know, they're like a lot of kids, they're, they're very concerned about the world and want to give money. And so they're like, oh, daddy, you, you work on stuff to do with charitable giving. Like, what, what charity should we give to if we want to help the climate? And I'm almost paralyzed <laughs> with like trying to explain to a nine and a seven year old all this stuff about trying you know well you could focus on service delivery or you could focus you know on upstream stuff around camp and their their eyes glaze <laughs> over and they <laughs> get very bored so oh, yeah it's a tough one isn't it because you want to I, I do the same sort of stuff with my kids all right so you could you want to sort of educate them about things but at the same time yeah it's <laughs> you, you don't want to turn them off from <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you've got you've got to Pitch it at the right level. Yeah, yeah. One of the topics that often comes up around philanthropy is around understanding the impact and effectiveness of different charities, different approaches and interventions and so on. Uh, and also, I suppose, from the philanthropist perspective, of understanding the impact of their giving and so on. And it's always something that you know, sort of different schools of thought and there's endless debate around the the kind of rights and wrongs of it what are your thoughts around the i suppose from the perspective you've had of looking at philanthropy and civil society what are your thoughts around how how do you assess the effectiveness of a, a given charity how do you think about that so I, I think it's a really interesting question and it's an interesting time to be thinking about it because i think the sort of when I when I first got into the philanthropy world, the, the very dominant narrative was, oh, it's all about impact. You know, all we need is a kind of a single measure of of, of impact that works across all charities, and that'll solve everything. Because you know, people will be able to give with confidence. People will then give more. Um, they'll you know they'll be able to take an investment mindset, and everything will be brilliant. And I think you know, over time, people have sort of come back round to realizing that maybe that's an overly simplistic way of looking at things and, and a, you know, can be a slightly dangerous one because as soon as you start to think about focusing only on things that could be measured, it puts a huge onus on what you are able to measure. And I think we pretty well know that, that a lot of the work and the value that charities offer isn't currently very well measured. And in fact, perhaps can never be measured in in those sorts of ways and so the danger there is if you focus on the measurement all of the money and the activity starts shifting towards the things that can be measured and the other stuff is therefore just seen as kind of nice to have or an externality and that seems to me a kind of that's a real problem and so I think there's been an interesting pushback against the drive for ever more measurement and focus on impact in recent years I guess my concern would be if you go too far the other way and say, oh, we don't need to focus on effectiveness or impact at all or measure anything, because that all that seems equally silly. Apart from anything else, surely you want to have some idea as a as a charity or as a donor to charity that the thing you're doing or giving money to is having some effect, even if it's not maximally effective. So it's kind of if measurement's done in the right way in a way that works for the charities themselves and isn't something that's kind of imposed on them from uh, from above. And if it's something that genuinely appeals to donors and kind of meets their requirements, then yeah, absolutely. But but we need to kind of focus in on what that looks like. And, and particularly, I think when we're talking about average donors uh, like you or I, and again, I'm assuming you're not a multi-million multi -millionaire <laughs> philanthropist here, I think a few years ago, again, there seemed to be a suggestion that actually metrics and hard figures would be the thing that would get average punters giving more. And I just don't think that's true. I mean, actually, the, the academic research on this suggests, if anything, it's the op opposite. If you give people more figures on impact and that sort of thing, it tends to make them give less because they just get a bit overwhelmed. And when we say people want evidence about the impact of their giving, I think really what we mean for a lot of people is they want to be told a compelling story about what has been done with their money. And that doesn't need to be a spreadsheet. 
it's often just a story about an individual or a case study or just a kind of narrative about the good that's being done with the work. So I think I think we need to kind of broaden our understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about impact and measurement. Yeah, I think that's I think that's certainly true. I think for the sort of smaller levels of giving, it's it's much more about the story and that's much more compelling for people to give. And then I think it is once you get to the larger amounts that then philanthropists or funders say, okay, that's great. Love the story, but also want to, you know, understand what's actually been delivered in terms of the outputs and how do you know that's making a difference and so on. And so, yeah, and totally accept the point around the kind of challenges with measurement and, and, you know, causality is always a kind of a really big one, isn't it? Because there's so much other stuff and there's been a lot more talk in the last couple of years around the sort of understanding of the complexity of the sort of wider context of the work's going on you know the complex systems that are around it there's a there's a slide that's been used a lot that toby Lowe always shows when he's talking about human learning systems and the, the sort of challenges of um, public management where it's um uh, all the factors around obesity and it's basically this like big kind of spaghetti map of like, all these different um, kind of influences on any given individual. And so having that idea of your more sort of traditional logic model of how a charity will have inputs and out- outputs, and that will lead to a specific outcome, and that's going to change a person's life. And that kind of ignores all of that other um, kind of big spaghetti diagram of stuff that's going on and seems to be less and less realistic. And I think with philanthropy as well, my concern is that what it's led to is what I often think of as the sort of philanthropic lone saviour myth, which is that philanthropy is about a single brilliant individual identifying a problem that they care about, determining what the solution is, and then giving to one or a small handful of organisations that are then going to somehow solve that problem. Whereas, as you say, that's not how these problems work. They're kind of they're caused by multiple factors that aren't going to be addressable by any one sector, let alone organization. And, you know, the, the the effects and the outputs that you have, particularly if they're longer term, will be felt again across a whole sort of range of things. So so forcing everybody into a mindset where you've got to be able to attribute cause and effect in a in a to sort of individual funders or organizations is crazy, really. Uh, but equally uh, so I suppose the the bit of it that I find interesting is then so what do you kind of use and you know if you kind of identify Mm. okay the sort of impact measurement stuff that's that was hyped up a lot years ago and it's kind of less so now but still requested a lot by funders um is you know you can see the limitations around that but I think one of the reasons why it's still asked for a lot is that there isn't really a strong alternative there's you know big people talk about trust-based philanthropy um, and I think a lot of that's great in that it's more, you know, you invest in organizations you believe in, you tend to give unrestricted funding, um, you you don't ask for those sorts of stringent measures, um, but you still have to make those judgments about which organizations do I trust to be effective, and you have to have some kind of process to make that assessment. So the the question is then, you know, again, yeah. what is it that makes an effective charity? And I think it's, and, and that's obviously a question that's been asked by so many people. And that's why, you know, people have tried to push that impact agenda um, and, and things like that to try and answer that question. It seems like we, we never really get further. I wonder whether it's because the answer is always, it kind of depends on, you know, the, what type of organization it is, the type of calls, what they're addressing, um, you know, whether it's uh, more sort of service delivery or policy work and campaigns and all, all those different types of approaches. And then all the different sort of causes that they might be working on. Um, you can see there are different, different types of approaches you might take in terms of judging whether an organization is effective or not. Um, and, and, yeah. And as you say, it it takes all those different organisations in a sector and different sectors to address an issue issue fully. So it's not like you can really make direct comparisons, um, which I think is always a really interesting challenge for philanthropists when they yeah, start yeah. to focus in and say, okay, we're going to address, um, I don't know, biodiverse, biodiversity in this particular area. Um, and then they were like, 
half dozen different organizations yeah. working on that particular thing how do you choose then how to fund and you know do you, how do you, you it's difficult yeah. to compare yeah. isn't it um so yeah i don't know if it, yeah. I, I, what are your thoughts on where we might be going with with that sort of conversation do you think there's any shift towards a new sort of approach that philanthropists and funders might be thinking about in terms of how they assess the effectiveness of charities or i think there is in the sense i mean there are a few different kind of trends that you can see and there's certainly a, a shift among some funders towards thinking about things at the level of systems there's a lot of talk about kind of systems change funding you know and and, and funding ecosystems rather than trying to fund individual organizations in isolation precisely because of that whole mm. point about that's that's not how these things work that's not the nature of these problems and that's not going to be the nature of their solutions and also you know what you mentioned already about the shift towards trust-based funding which i think you know, there's obviously an increase in focus on that for purely practical reasons during the pandemic, because suddenly lots of funders had to just get money out of the door quite quickly. And a lot of their grantees just weren't able to do the things they'd originally got the funding for. So they had, you know, the funders had to were sort of pushed to say, well, we just trust you to spend the money on whatever it is you need to spend it on now. And I think for a lot of them, you know, the sky didn't fall in on their heads and they were quite reassured and they thought, oh, hang on a minute, could we do more of our funding like this? Um, and I, you know, I think as with a lot of things of the pandemic, some of that will just bounce back to how it was before, but other funders have started out much more on a path of thinking, can we fund on a on a trust basis by by default? And I think that's really positive, but as with so many things in philanthropy as well, that you know you need to be careful about not being like right well trust based funding that's the way we should do things and it's perfect because you know again going to what we were saying about measurement if trust based funding you know sort of accidentally became mm -hmm. something that allowed organizations to scrap the idea that you need to measure anything and as a result you end up funding organizations that themselves have really have no idea about you know whether what they're doing is genuinely useful or not then you will you will end up funding ineffective organizations and wasting money because you know we have to be honest even though donors imposing overly regular rigorous measurement on um charities is not a good thing equally some charities are ineffective and produce little or, or no good so so being able to ask the question of themselves can we look ourselves in the eye every day and say well we're pretty confident we know what we're doing is genuinely worthwhile and producing some some kind of social value and how do we know that if you don't have some kind of answer to that question even if it's not one that's being demanded of you by a funder that seems to me you know quite a big problem and i think the, the other thing about trust-based funding i was having a really interesting conversation with, mm -hmm. with a few people about this the other day is we often talk about trust as a really inherently positive and wholesome thing because it sounds good doesn't it we trust each other it's trust basis let's do that but the danger from the point of view of funding is when does trust become something that actually becomes quite exclusionary and cliquey because trust implies that you know somebody already and you've built a relationship with them and if that just means funders then stick to funding the organizations they already know and trust surely that's not mm -hmm. the end result yeah. that we wanted either so how do we kind of get a balance between building trust but also allowing space for new organizations to to come into the room and develop trust with funders as well yeah i think that's a, a tricky aspect of it isn't it i think the um i think there are definitely ways to approach that question of charities not focusing on the measurement so much but still working to understand the impact of their work and i suppose it, it's the shift away from measurement in order to prove and shifting to learning in order to improve and it's having that learning and evaluation but not not necessarily saying like here's our kind of fixed outcome statements and indicators and so on but taking a often a, a sort of more qualitative approach to that that sort of learning process have you i don't know from your perspective working with with philanthropists or around philanthropy if you've seen examples or have thoughts on on what you can do as a smaller charity with limited resource to perhaps show yourself to be an organization that's effective and that can be trusted in if that if people are looking at that trust-based philanthropy 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it is a it's a tricky one, and it's it's a it's a weird one as well because my experience of philanthropists is often the organisations they most love are small charities. Like I think mm-hmm. because both they're often what they're doing is more tangible. You can often just kind of go and see what they're doing, and you can get your head around them as an organisation. They they often sort of appeal to a a view in the minds of donors about what a, a sort of generalized ideal charity looks like which probably mm-hmm. isn't a sort of huge um national organization or a federated one it's probably a kind of a local organization doing you know work in their in their local area um and and also as a donor you know there's something quite appealing about the likelihood that if you get involved with a small organization you are going to be your donation is going to be more significant to that organization than if you give, you know, the same amount to a much larger organization. So for all of those reasons, I think they're kind of really appealing. The challenge though, obviously, as you said, is that they don't necessarily have the resources or the knowledge or the skills to find who those potential supporters and and big donors are. Um, So I think there's, you know, there's a, there are various things that can be done. I guess one thing for any organization working in a local area is to make sure you've got a good relationship with your local community foundation, because they're a really valuable sort of intermediary between donors and organizations doing the work. And they can both, you know, actually pass on grant money if they're managing that themselves, uh, in, you know, in the form of endowment or a grant making fund. And they will also have probably have clients who have their own kind of managed trusts and will often be looking for advice and suggestion from the community foundation about, you know, what they could be giving to you locally. And the only way the community foundation is going to be able to make that recommendation is if they know who you are. I think the same thing also goes for um, kind of networks of other advisors who aren't necessarily specific to philanthropy. I think very quickly when you start talking about or talking to wealthy donors or prospective donors you realize that the really crucial people are the sort of gatekeepers to that wealth and they're often people like um you know accountants lawyers private bankers wealth advisors because unless unless those wealthy people already sort of know about a charity or have networks of other people they know who are kind of involved as trustees and they get recommendations that way often the first time they'll think about philanthropy is when they're in a conversation with one of these advisors about you know their mm-hmm. tax affairs or they kind of offhandedly mention they wouldn't mind doing a bit of more serious stuff for charity and so you know if that uh, advisor knows about your organization or knows about you know where they can uh, go to to get more um, uh, kind of general advice again that might be a sort of community foundation or it might be a specialist philanthropy advisor that is absolutely crucial so i think finding ways to get on the the radar of those advisors is hugely valuable for um for any organization that wants to try and tap into to philanthropy because you know we want to believe that philanthropy is this thing that is kind of you know data driven and uh, as objective as possible and is all about kind of you know rationality and measurement and people making you know good choices about where to to give to the best organization but in reality a lot of it is still based on personal relationships and recommendation and if you know a a donor uh hears from one of their peers or somebody who they trust as an advisor that a certain organization is interesting in doing good work in their local area that will probably go a very long way towards giving them the confidence to make that initial donation um, so I think, you know, that that is one thing um, that's really valuable. Unfortunately, in practice, it's, it's not necessarily as easy as all that because finding your way into those networks of kind of um, wealth advisors and private bankers and, and that sort of thing is is sometimes easier said than done. But there you just have to look for kind of places where those sorts of people are already have networks and see if there are kind of opportunities to to uh you know to get involved and to raise your organization's profile with them um so yeah so i'd say that you know those are some kind of practical ways that you can go about doing that mm. thank you uh, can we come back to uh you mentioned technology trends in philanthropy yeah uh, that you've been looking at for since your time with CAF, and i know more recently i'd be interested to just kind of take you back first of all to think about what were what were the kind of the big tech trends that were being talked about 
whenever it was that you first started looking at that uh, to be interesting to see what's then emerged in reality yeah uh, and then maybe what the what the kind of current thinking is what are some of the big things that we see coming up next yeah definitely um i mean where where it all the tech stuff particularly started for me was around cryptocurrency and and latterly sort of blockchain stuff which which is really interesting as a story about how the arc of these things go so i kind of i'd started i wrote a blog i think back in 2013 or something when i kind of became aware of, of bitcoin it was a sort of first wave of people writing mainstream news stories about what's this thing uh mm -hmm. in this new form of money and i kind of just in a relatively naive way thought "Ooh, new form of money you know what does that mean potentially for fundraising or giving that kind of thing um and that sort of developed a bit of a head of steam and you know i kind of looked into it more and as i understood that technology more there was quite a lot of interesting stuff it seemed to me about the potential promise in terms of the the sort of the affordances of the technology so the things that it might enable you to do around Kind of adding different attributes to money and also kind of radical transparency and moving money to parts of the world where there wasn't necessarily traditional banking infrastructure and this sort of thing so so we kind of explored that through a whole load of um discussion papers and really got quite deep in the weeds on it and for a few years i was involved a lot in conversations around cryptocurrency and blockchain and, and philanthropy and you know going to events uh, here there and everywhere about it I guess what I then saw a few years on, I started to get a bit disillusioned because I thought, well, yeah, none of that theoretical uh, promise seems to have really come to, to fruition. I've, you know, I'd spoken to quite a lot of people who had set up projects looking at sort of blockchain and philanthropy and trying to use it in various interesting ways, but they were the same handful of people that there had been a few years before. And then also there was a kind of wave of, I thought, much less credible projects trying to sort of launch you know, charity tokens and have ICOs mm -hmm. and this kind of thing and I, I didn't like that stuff at all um, and then obviously you know the value of the crypto market kind of crashed um, and people became a lot more sort of uh, skeptical about the whole thing anyway and there became more awareness of um, you know the problems with kind of uh, fraud and grifting uh, and the environmental impact of the technology so I think where we've got to now is there's there's still some interest in you know crypto philanthropy I think so just people using cryptocurrency for philanthropy yeah. all the stuff around the wider use of blockchain for philanthropy to me I think you still see sort of blogs and things written in the tech world about it but there's there's less interest from what I can see about that in in the sort of mainstream philanthropy world I think the the interesting thing about that is is it's a good warning about the dangers, the balancing the need to engage with technology and sort of genuinely think about what it might mean and what it could bring, but not get carried away by hype because there is a, there is a lot of hype mm -hmm. in the tech sector. And, you know, the most informed technologists and investors in the world often can't tell at the time which are the overhyped technologies and which are the yeah. ones that are going to stay the distance. So the chances that those of us on the fringes of it in the philanthropy world are going to be any better are pretty minimal um so i think that that need to kind of balance engaging with it and understanding it but making sure you retain a cool head and don't sort of get carried away is really um important i think what what i ended up doing at CAF and have sort of subsequently done is 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 think we got into a position with this blockchain and cryptocurrency stuff that was quite interesting which is knowing enough about the technology to sort of stand in a room of tech experts and credibly talk about it but from the perspective of being the one person in the room who genuinely understands charities and philanthropy and so kind of can can think uh in quite a you know in a more detailed way about what that overlap might look like and we then did um some similar work around the impact of ai and we did bits and pieces around kind of immersive technology so vr and ar and and latterly some stuff about kind of metaverse um and so yeah i think it's you know that ongoing need to kind of engage with not necessarily what is the thing that everybody's just talking about right now um but what what is this technology and what what again as i say the affordances are kind of broadly the things it allows you to do and my opportunities it might open up and how do those relate to philanthropy and and it, you know a good example of that is at this exact moment in time there's a huge amount of hype all of a sudden around um chat gpt and kind of mm -hmm. you know the seeming explosion in 
uh, the capabilities of conversational AI. And, and I'm doing a bit of work at the moment. I'm writing an article about you know what chat GPT and, and generative AI more broadly might mean for philanthropy. And again, it's very easy to get carried away because some of this stuff is really, really impressive. But you know, you do need to slightly guard against that and you know take into account the the slightly more skeptical voices out there. But equally, you know, the reality is this stuff is going to have an impact because it's, you know, in terms of productivity tools and automation of processes and changes to the way that search works in the online environment, it's, it is going to have a big impact on, on everyone, uh, mm -hmm. charities included. So I think kind of thinking that stuff through so that it doesn't just happen anyway and charities suddenly turn around and think, oh, everything's changed. Um, you know, you've got to try and slightly, you know, stay ahead of the curve if at all possible. Um, but it is a challenge for organizations that often the biggest challenge I think around technology is, I mean, there's a, there's a knowledge gap, uh, I think, just about what the technology is and what's happening. But there's also just a time and space gap. One, mm -hmm. one of the things I think that charities struggle with most when it comes to thinking about, you know, the impact of technology or just the sort of bigger picture around the work they do they just don't have the luxury of stopping and sitting there stroking their chin and you know thinking about things in the way that i do um because they they just have to focus on you know the work they're doing and getting money in through the door and keeping the lights on um and so you know people like me and others who do have the luxury of a bit of time and space to to do that thinking i think have a real responsibility to try and bring you know other charities along with us and make this stuff useful to them so it can kind of inform their thinking yeah i think it's absolutely a lack of capacity to really investigate these things isn't it for the vast majority of organizations yeah and even for the really big ones really it's still difficult to um keep up with these things and as you say when the sort of leading tech experts and investors don't know you know which thing is going to emerge and, and what's going to happen then um, none of us have got much hope of predicting with any accuracy what's what's worth sort of investing in from a, a charity's perspective of what, yeah. what's going to either improve their their work or their fundraising or um, whatever it might be so I suppose we're always lagging behind the private sector in terms of understanding what the impact of those technologies are going to be both positive and negative but potentially dealing with the fallout of any negative impact yeah well that that's a really important point because i often in the work i'm doing on tech and my, my sort of starting pitch to particularly to audiences that haven't necessarily come to hear about tech stuff so there's, there's a slight element of wondering why they care so you know if i'm talking to a room of charity trustees or finance directors and there's a they're looking down at their uh, order paper for the day and thinking oh what's this session about my pitch will be there's there's this stuff about the impact of technologies on charities that is them taking advantage of these tools and using them in interesting ways to achieve their mission all the sort of tech for good stuff that i think is really interesting and there's some great examples but i i worry it's often a bit self-selecting and it's kind of you've got to be at a certain level of awareness and engagement to to really kind of get that stuff or to think it's for you and then i think there's okay even if you don't think that stuff is for you as a charity what about the ways in which this technology both for good and bad is going to have an impact on the operating environment you know how the finance function works how hr works how the banking system works because that will affect you so you should probably at least be aware of that and even if you sort of want to put your head in the sand about that what about the way in which the technology is going to change the nature of the challenges facing the people in the communities that you work with because it is doing that in lots of different ways and if you don't understand that and adapt to that, the real risk there is is a sort of existential one that in a few years' time, you what you're doing will be irrelevant to those people and you won't be achieving your mission anymore. And that, I think, tends to make people sit up and think, oh, hang on a minute, I do see why technology is relevant, even if it's not something I thought I needed to be interesting in. in, in. Okay, that's probably enough on technology because I will soon get lost. <laughs> yeah. That's a bit of a Luddite. So can I ask you, what, what frustrates you at the moment about the kind of current practice in philanthropy and what, what would be your hope for future practice? Um, I guess my frustrations with philanthropy are, I mean, one is the, the lack of data around it, which I think anyone who spends any time in the philanthropy world will 
we'll suddenly realize that there are just so many things that you would think that we know about levels of giving and where giving goes and, and what giving looks like that we don't know. And, and you know, the number of times I've had calls from you know journalists and people outside the sector to say, oh, you know, but can you just tell me where I can find this figure? And I have to say, no, because nobody knows. Um, and, and so I think, you know, there's a lot more to be done on that, both so that we kind of understand giving better and also th so that we can improve the sort of transparency of philanthropy as a whole and kind of make it more accountable and, and kind of help bolster trust in it. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's not just getting more data. I think it's getting data in a way that is open and usable um, by all sorts of different people. So I think the work that people like 360 Giving are doing on this is really fascinating because it is trying to sort of really shift the dial on that and kind of make philanthropy more more open and, and easy to understand through data. I think the, the other big frustration for me, it's probably less to do with practice, it's more to do with how people talk about philanthropy and how that sort of ends up in, you know, policy narratives about philanthropy and discussions in the sector, which which goes back to, you know, something we were saying back at the beginning, which is often a lot of these issues end up sort of collapsing into slightly sort of polarized arguments about well this is the right way to do things and that's the wrong way or this is good and that's bad um, and it reflects I think the fact that you know society as a whole feels more polarized on a lot of issues but I think with a lot of questions about philanthropy and particularly your sort of quite practical ones about how you should do it and and kind of what the best you know, the best approaches are it, it's not as simple as that. I think it's, you know, there is either no clear answer because actually the, the answer is somewhere in that kind of gray area in the middle, or, you know, both approaches can be right. They're just different. So, you know, take for instance, the, the whole argument um, about uh, the timescales of philanthropy. And some people saying, well, you know, there shouldn't be any perpetual philanthropy and endowments shouldn't exist forever. It should all be spent down and we should all kind of shift to that. And, and I think there's there's a lot to be said for having more urgency in philanthropy and kind of questioning why you want to just hold on to, to endowments. But then equally, there is another side of the argument, which is, well, yeah, but the unique value of philanthropy for a long time has been it is able to take a longer term view and it's able to kind of stick with issues over the long term. So we wouldn't want in our rush to have more urgency to just spend all the money now and then find none of these institutions are around anymore that that used to be there to fund things over the longer term so i think that you know that a lot of this stuff is a lot more nuanced than it sometimes gets um presented uh, and when it ends up getting discussed in ways where that nuance just gets kind of obliterated that i find really really frustrating because i'm sort of all the work i'm doing is trying to sort of inject nuance back into some of this stuff oh yeah i suppose it's um part of the um the nature of kind of online um articles and things you need yeah. a kind of clickbaity title to get people to read it and and say in there's a lot of nuance to this and we need to consider both sides doesn't doesn't kind of get the clicks in oh, the I same know. way that <laughs> something a bit more um, uh, no it 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 doesn't oh, and yeah. it's it's the whole sort of attention economy stuff isn't it you know the, the problem is the way the internet mm. works is that's what it rewards and and leads people to prioritize and the problem with philanthropy is it's easier to write polemics and mm. it's probably more fun to be honest my life would be more yeah. fun and easier if i was just like right i'm just going to write a load of articles about how terrible philanthropy is because mm. i you know i know what all the arguments are because i spend all my time thinking about them and i could write great versions yeah. of like <laughs> you know here's a takedown of, of philanthropy oh, yeah. but i don't believe that because it's too simple um so yeah it's frustrating yeah the uh, the damaging thing about that taking that view as well is that then philanthropists say well it's not bother then like why <laughs> why am i going to give anything if i'm just going to be absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Read for it uh, yeah you think I'll just go and buy another yacht <laughs> or whatever instead yeah you get really defensive understandably okay so for your more nuanced views and so on. What, where, where are the best places that people should go to find out more? Where would you point people towards? Uh, about my work? Yeah, your, your, your work and, you know, potentially others, um, if there are kind of resources you'd recommend or, or other kind of people that you'd, or organisations you'd point people towards. Yeah, I, I mean, as a starting point, I mean, in terms of my stuff, a good place 
to go these days is to the um, whyphilanthropymatters.com, um, which is you know where I've increasingly sort of pulled together all the articles that I'm uh, doing. And there's also the, the podcasts there now, um, and lots of links to bits where I've written articles and things for, for other people. So, and there's kind of short guides to topics and themes about the history of philanthropy and kind of current issues. Um, I'm going to be carrying on adding loads and loads more. Um, I think in terms of other places to go, I mean, I, I end up reading quite a lot of stuff from other places in the world. I mean, understandably the US, because I think the the level of discussion and debate about philanthropy there is just, there's more of it and it tends to be a bit more sophisticated. But also you do have to be careful because the context is quite different. But I think there, you know, the news outlets like the Chronicle of Philanthropy and uh, Inside Philanthropy and then mainstream outlets like Vox, I think, do really good coverage of, of philanthropy as well. There's a there's a growing number of podcasts out there of, of all sorts, uh, people talking about things and, and basically kind of any flavor you want. You can get, you know, the stuff I do is some some. Uh, interviews obviously and then also kind of deep dive episodes and obviously it's more you know it's at the relatively like you've got to to know about philanthropy to listen to the stuff I do and then there's others you know where people are interviewing kind of people working on the ground in uh, grassroots organizations or talking to donors about what it is that motivates them and their personal stories so I think there's there's a whole you know ecosystem of stuff out there about philanthropy um it's good I think just it's not so much a recommendation as a kind of a plea is uh, what I would really like to see from my own point of view is is more stuff that I think does approach philanthropy in a way that makes it something that's interesting to a kind of more general audience and has that in mind. The thing that always drove me nuts working, you know, at, um, it more kind of as a practitioner in in the philanthropy sector is there's there's so many reports and things written about philanthropy that I think just basically are very technocratic and end up saying the same stuff over and over again um and and it just I don't know a lot of energy gets expended on that and I'm not sure it's moving uh anything forward so I think kind of thinking about how we tell a story and craft a narrative about what philanthropy is and what role it plays in society that might actually catch the attention of people outside of this little bubble that's something I think we need to be doing a lot more. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I wonder if there's something that strikes me as well and that we do tend to talk about the really big philanthropy a lot as well. And it's kind of natural in a way that you, you know, that's the kind of stuff that uh, sort of stands out most when there's some big announcement from whoever it is who's given tons of money to one cause or organization or whatever it might be and and a lot of the sort of reports and things that come out focus more at the larger end of philanthropy and while it's sort of interesting in in a lot of ways and certainly from the kind of academic side of thinking about philanthropy it's that stuff that i suppose when you talk about shaping society and things like that that's the relevant stuff but i suppose for the vast majority of the charity sector and civil society actually the um the philanthropy that's maybe a bit more connected is the philanthropists who are still very wealthy people but are kind of you know giving ten thousand pounds to an organization because actually that's something that for a small local charity that might actually happen for them you know they might you know they're not going to engage with jeff bezos or any of those sorts of people but actually someone worth five million pounds in their area who would be given at that type of level and i suppose there's there's like the reports don't cover that end of it i don't think you know you get the kind of coots million donor million pound donor report and things like that that talk about the larger stuff but you don't you don't kind of get the the sort of i don't know what level you would call that the, the sort of the lower end of high value philanthropy if you like i suppose that yeah so it's sort of beyond beyond mass affluent I, it's it's true because like one thing we used to in terms of data that we used to find was when we were at CAF obviously we did kind of UK giving as the, the research on on kind of levels of giving and that captures the kind of mass market stuff and then there was there was I mean I don't think they do it anymore but things like the Coots million pound donor report and that captures you know the, the, the top end of the market and then there is that just that missing middle as you say of people who are giving what by most people's reckoning would be significant amounts of money but it's not tens of millions of pounds and you've probably never heard of these people 
and that that is i know from my own work i'm actually one of the things i'm doing at the moment is working with beth breeze on on a book and part of that involves kind of interviewing philanthropists and we're trying to look outside the usual suspects and find some more of those people and it's difficult because it you just you know finding who they are in the first place and and kind of identifying what it is they do philanthropically is often a challenge but when you do, you suddenly realise there, there's loads of them. There's all of these people out there doing a lot of interesting philanthropy at that slightly lower level that 99% of people in the sector, let alone the public at large, have no idea about. So, so yeah, I totally agree. I think, you know, if we can get more awareness of that and sort of shift people's understanding when you say philanthropy from it's all about Jeff Bezos and and, and that kind of ultra elite stuff happening in the US to... It's actually something that might be happening around about me in my local area and actually kind of funding things I can see when I walk down the street. That, that I think, might help to kind of craft a narrative that makes more sense to people. Yeah, yeah. And I think people can connect to it a mm. bit more in a way that it, it feels more like something happening in the same world as them yeah. as opposed to something that's kind of off out there in the ether and yeah, a bit less, bit less kind of based in their own reality. What else? Is there anything else? Have we have we missed any major topics or any any things that we should cover? I mean, there's there's always other things, <laughs> government, but no, I think that's, that feels like feels like plenty. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good good coverage of uh, what philanthropy is and some of the some of the interesting things to consider. So, thank you, thank you, Rodri, for your time. As I said, I will put numerous links to useful things on the web page all of your sort of stuff that's online the upcoming book for the pre-order any other bits and pieces that you can think of that are worth putting on there you mentioned you'd written a, a blog at some point about that kind of thought exercise around yeah giving um if you send me the link i'll stick that on there and stuff as well yeah yeah i will do yeah so great thanks very much great thanks alex thank you for listening to this episode of the charity impact podcast and thank you for listening all the way to the end just one more thing before you go, if you listen to the podcast, I'd love to hear what you think. You can either leave a review on Spotify, Apple, etc., or tag me in a post on LinkedIn or Twitter at alexblake underscore K-E-D-A, or just drop me an email. For details on all episodes with notes and links to resources, head to our website, kedaconsulting.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care.